editing your photos. You either love it or you hate it. And the results are probably showing in your work. I know when I first started on my photography journey, I would run from the laptop. I didn't want anything to do with it. I just wanted to be a photographer and not edit my photos whatsoever. But honestly, it was really showing in the quality of my photographs. So in the video today, I want you to learn from some of my early mistakes and I'm gonna show you how to fix them so you can get better, more refined looking results. Let's take a look. All right guys, if you wanna follow along, you can download the raw file via the link below. And what we're gonna do is somewhat process this image from start to finish. And I wanna show you those mistakes to avoid as we go along, but more importantly, how to correct them. So let's take a look at our file here. This is a, a beautiful sunrise we had at Lake O'Hare. Now, I haven't adjusted the image whatsoever. I'm here in Photoshop ACR, Adobe Camera Raw. If you're a Lightroom user, jump in Lightroom. The layout is pretty much identical. Now, before we really get into the nitty gritty of those mistakes and how to correct them, the first thing that we just wanna do is balance out the dynamic range here. We've got lots of highlights, lots of shadows. So quickly to do that, I'm just gonna bring up the overall exposure so every tone is evenly raised so it looks natural. Obviously now that's really made that sky worse. So we'll just pull down those highlights. What I like to do here is just keep an eye on the histogram, making sure that you can see that right hand side, the highlights are clipping a little bit, that's quite natural. Um, but I've recovered the majority of it. And now we'll raise up the shadows a touch so we can see those darker details. I don't want to go too far though, and we'll talk about this later, but for now, I might go about there, plus 40. Let's get into our first tip though. The first mistake that we can make in our post-processing, and I was definitely guilty of this back in the day, this slider right here, our friend contrast. Now, when we grab that contrast slider, start cranking it to the right-hand side. What is contrast? The darks get darker, the brights get brighter. We're increasing the tonal range. Now, if you look at the histogram as I increase the contrast, look at it spreading out. Look at those dark tones on the left just start to go darker, darker, darker. The highlights on the right, bang, completely blow out. I'm gonna reset that. Does this image need more global contrast right now? We can see by the histogram, we've already pushing the limits of losing our data anyway. It's already a high contrast scene. By increasing that contrast, we're, we're just starting to lose data. The other thing I wanna point out, and this is the main tip that I wanna mention is, keep in mind all of these are global adjustments, meaning it's applying to the entire image. If I'm increasing contrast now on that slider, it's happening in the foreground, the background, the midground, the sky, absolutely everywhere. We don't wanna do that in landscape photography. Why? This is why. Let me zoom in on this distant mountain back here on the left. Now, what do we notice about the dark tones in that mountain compared to our foreground rocks? What's happening with the shadows there? The shadows in the foreground are deeper and darker than those off in the distance. And that is how atmospherics works. That's just how the eye sees the world. When we grab that contrast slider, Let's look at that distant mountain now and watch how dark it starts to get. Now those shadows in there have become much darker. The tonal range in the distance has increased the contrast, right? We don't want it to increase back there because we're losing that natural sense of depth. This is how a landscape painter would paint a scene. They start off in the distance with muted faded tones, no blacks. Then as we progress into the foreground, that's when the blacks get introduced. So to correct this problem of having too much contrast through the scene, what I recommend is local adjustments to alter the contrast, not global adjustments. So the way to do it locally is by using our friend, the adjustment brush. We click the masking button and there it is there, brush. Or the shortcut is K. If you're in Lightroom, I believe the shortcut is B. Have a look anyway. So when I click that brush now, if I push the open and close bracket, if you've seen any of my other tutorials, you'll know this is my main tool that I like to use. So open and close bracket to change the size or right click and slide your mouse left and right. The key though, for me, the way I like to use the brush is it's a soft edge, right? So the inner circle will get 100% of the adjustment. The outer circle is where it just fades out to nothing. So to do that, we want the feather set to 100. I also personally like to leave the flow and density to 100. So when I click, it applies the adjustment and that's it. If I go over it, it won't keep adding on. And what I suggest you do is start to incorporate with your contrast adjustments, high contrast in the front, less in the mid ground, 
and then less in the distance again. Now, if we look at this image here, that's already happening, isn't it? We've got those really dark tones in the front, a little less in the midground, and then as we fade off, the blacks in that distance are nowhere near as heavy and deep as the foreground. So to further create that sense of depth, what I'll do in the distance is decrease the levels of the blacks back there. So on the adjustment brush, I jump over to the black slider and I'll raise that up. You can even do the shadows as well if you like. And watch me just run this along and it's just lifting up those darker tones, okay? Let me turn that on and off. You'll just see quick before and after, before, after. Okay, creating that natural sense of depth. I'm gonna push K for a new brush. This time I'll do the same thing, but not as heavy on my adjustment. And I'll hit the mid, uh, the mid ground, just lightly like that. And then just a touch in the foreground here with the same brush, like so. Simply by doing that, we'll just turn it all on and off now, local adjustments. We've really emphasized the fact that those mountains are further away and we've kept that high contrast in the front. So we have a nice natural sense of depth, just like you would see in a painting. Now, of course, like I said, this is what happens in the real world. Walk outside now and analyze something far off in the distance. You'll see it's more of a blue mauve in the distance instead of black, but it sees raw files. This is where we get into the problem. You know, once you get the raw file in the computer and you start manipulating these big global adjustments, very, very quickly do we start to break down that natural sense of depth and separation. Okay, let's move on to the next mistake that I personally would make, and I've seen my workshop clients do it time and time again. This stems from the fact that our dynamic range in the cameras is so big now, we have the ability to reveal a lot of details. And what can happen is, and this is the mistake, is over brightening the foreground. And this just simply happens because by nature, you know, often the foregrounds will have those darker tones as we've talked about already. And when you get into the computer here, most people just want to start running down the sliders and having a play. And for example, if you grab those the shadow slider and crank that right up, obviously now we've really been able to see the foreground detail. What happens is naturally it's it's a bit of a wow, a, a wow moment because you're seeing something that was, you know, quite dull come to life. And a lot of people will raise it up like I just did and be like, wow, that cool, I can see all that now and then continue on with the processing. The problem with doing this guys is it goes back to that first tip. We've now lost that natural sense of depth. Remember, we need to have higher contrast in the front for it to replicate the real world. Now, of course, we wanna reveal those foreground details. That's why we have a foreground, but it needs to be darker. One, it looks more natural, but two, and primarily, the darker foreground is gonna lead the eye into the background. We use light to pull the eye through the frame. So if I pull those shadows back down, Let's say I leave it on about 50, for example. Where is the brightest part of the image? It's basically back here in the sky where the highlights are. Where is my main subject matter? It's back there where the highlights are. The eye will then skim over the foreground. The foreground's there is just a way to create depth and hopefully push the eye through the frame. If we pull up those shadows way too bright, now the eye is just as inclined to fix on that foreground instead of actually traveling off into the background. And the same thing can actually happen up in the sky if the sky is too bright. So what I'll do with this image, we'll leave the shadows approximately, let's say 55. You wanna have darker edges. That, that's the short answer here, guys. Darker edges and light in the back. I'm gonna leave the foreground as is. With the sky, I'm gonna push K for my brush. And this time, I'll just simply pull down the exposure half a stop roughly using the edge of the brush, and I'm gonna zoom out slightly, so I just push control minus. Now I can really use that edge of the brush like that, nice and soft. I'm darkening that top part of the sky. Why am I doing that? One, it's gonna push the eye to the background. Two, the cloud up there is closer to the viewer than the cloud off in the distance here. Goes back to what I mentioned before, darker tones for whatever's closest to the viewer, lighter tones as we fade off into the distance, less tonal range on the horizon compared to what's above. So we simply darken the sky like that. We can adjust accordingly, Just leave that a little bit darker. Now the brightest portion's in the back. If we wanted to, I'll push K, I'll just go back to full screen. With this brush, you could gently raise up the exposure for where the main subject matter is. So I'm doing exposure now. I'll go careful on the light off to the side there but like that. 
So now if we do a before and after, that's when we had the bright sky. So you can see by darkening that edge, it's pushed the eye to the centre. And then this is where we simply just brighten things off in that centralised part. And then just leaving that foreground a bit darker. So keep in mind, darker edges, let the most light be in the background where the main subject matter is. And then the eye is going to go flowing all the way through don't reveal too many details in that foreground otherwise bang the eye is just going to stop there and you're not going to have the viewer's eye travel all the way through the scene another thing that i used to do another mistake it happens in our global adjustments again we go back to those this time it's not in regards to the tonal range it's in regard to color and something that i would find myself doing was particularly if i did have a sunrise or sunset scene but maybe the color really wasn't you know really popping kind of what we got in this photo here it's actually going off quite nicely but let's face it that's not not always the case as you know very well so what i would do is i'll jump up on the temperature and tint slide and I would think that I was now creating a sunrise or sunset that was decent so I would start to warm up the image like so and then I would introduce a little bit of magenta and when you're doing this you're often fixated just up on the sky you're just analyzing the sky not realizing that you've obviously just adjusted those colors those tones throughout the entire scene which is completely unnatural and we've all seen these photos straight away you can just tell that this has been done because it doesn't look right so how do we correct this to you know maybe still have that nice warm light going on in the sky but not necessarily down in the foreground for example well, i'm going to reset these global adjustments here and what we're going to go look at is a way to adjust colors locally. And to do that, I like to use the color grading tool. So as we open that up, we can now look at our midtones, our shadows and the highlights. We want color separation through the scene. We've spoken about tonal separation, leading the eye through high contrast to less contrast. Let's do the same with color. Cool here, warm there, break up the image into a variety of different color tones instead of just a big flat warm tone or a big um, blue cold tone which just doesn't look natural so here in the grading we can adjust any of those tones now one of the main things that you want to do and this is for portraits nature often if you're shooting in the golden hour the golden hour is so beautiful because we have warm highlights and then generally the shadows are going to be a little bit cooler all those dark tones it's happening right here in this image but let's emphasize it further so to do that i'm going to go down to the highlight wheel and what you do is you select the hue that you want first and foremost the hue that I want to run with is a, a warm orangey tone here to match the light in the sky. So I'm going to grab that outside wheel and that's how I adjust the hue. I'm going to leave it about there. Now to apply the saturation, it's picking this inner circle and dragging that outwards. You see as I tried to do that, it started to move that outer circle around and it gets a little bit fidgety to move. So the best thing to do is place it where you want it hold shift and that will put that black line there now it's fixed to run to that hue and what we do is we start to apply it and you'll see the difference straight away in the image as we do that and then you can adjust accordingly so you're basically picking the hue and then adjusting the saturation levels for that individual hue we've warmed up the highlights there let's do the opposite now with the shadows so in order to do that run that dial into the blue I'm gonna hold shift and then I just slowly introduce very subtly those blue tones and I might run that along. Now, you're probably thinking, well, how do I know which color is the right one? Trial and error, really. And walking away from the image and coming back and asking yourself, does it look natural or not? And just experience, you know, the more you do this, the easier it's gonna get. With the mid-tones, every photo is gonna be different here. You might wanna cool it, you might wanna warm it, you might wanna leave it alone. For this one, let's just have a quick look if we warm them up out of curiosity because there are a lot of mids in this image so it's going warmer and then I might just spin that around and analyze the result because this is going to heavily affect that top part of the sky that's where a lot of the mid tones are dial that back yeah for this image you know there's no real right or wrong it's just, that's the whole point of being subtle here you're not going to make a big dramatic um, mistake I think I'd probably leave it a little bit on the cooler side completely subjective but I think I'd leave it there. Let's turn the grading on and off now. Before, after. It's incredibly subtle, isn't it? 
I'm gonna crank that a little bit more just for the sake of the demonstration on the highlights primarily. Let's turn that on and off before, after. That's taking a stronger effect for sure. If we went back to the basic and did that, watch how quick it just really goes downhill. It's just all getting too warm. So just keep that in mind. The color grading is our friend. And the other way to work on colors locally, you guessed it, the adjustment brush. So you can still use this as a way to just warm up individual pockets of the frame. So for example, I might just run down to the temperature and tint on the brush, warm me up slightly. And then back here where the light is in the mountains, I could just emphasize that even more running along the water. You might want to do the opposite, cool the brush down and then hit the foreground, for example. But if you're breaking up your colors all through the frame, you're going to make a huge difference and get a way more professional result. The last thing that I want to talk about is you could summarize it by calling it detail, but having too much detail all through the frame. Now, what am I getting at here? Well, we've got a few sliders. Now, these sliders, when I first started, I love these guys, particularly the clarity slider. Because when I adjusted that, I would see a big dramatic change in the image. Let's crank that right now. Okay, see what's happening there. But now we have the dehaze, and we also have the texture slider as well. Now, like I said, one of the things that happens is when we adjust these globally, we start to see certain things happen in the image. And when we're first starting out, it's, it's very appealing to see this big dramatic change happening. And we get fixated on one part of the image and don't realize what's happening to the rest of it. Generally, it could be going downhill pretty quick. All three of these sliders adjust contrast in different ways. If you look at the histogram as we adjust those, clarity, for example, see the mid-tone contrast is spreading out so in the mids there texture way more subtle very very subtle and then the dehaze is a little see it's pulling those darker tones getting darker 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 mids so they all do different things when we're doing it globally though we're losing again it's just going back to that same thing the sense of depth the three dimensionality how we see the real world the real world is whatever's closest to the viewer should have those sharper details more texture for example anything off in the distance really shouldn't we should be adhering to that effect that we spoke about at the start less tonal range remember less contrast back there so my tip is, if you're going to, it works in a weird way. If we want to make the image look more detailed, we only really need to do it in the foreground and actually leave the background. So using an adjustment brush for this image, one, I've selected a foreground that has high detail, high, high contrast, and all of these sharp lines. I've selected that on purpose. It really just gives us a strong presence as if we're there and create a sense of depth. So we could simply on this brush, increase the texture, and then we're just gonna run that along in the foreground. And it's probably a bit hard to see now through the screen, but if we crank that up, it's really bringing out those details in the front. Now, every image is gonna be different. If you have rocks in the front or some shattered ice or something, yeah, let's really bring it out. If it's a fern or a flower, I'd be very fine with what I'm doing there. For today's example, let's bring it right up to 30. I find myself very rarely ever using the clarity anymore because it's bringing up the whites in this case. It's just too much contrast really for this particular scene. Now I do the opposite in the background. I'm gonna push K and I won't necessarily bring the texture down, but I'll, what I will bring down is the dehaze and I actually rehaze the background, which is actually somewhat adjusting that tonal range like what we did in our mistake number one. But it's further giving the illusion that that foreground has a lot more texture, placing the viewer right there as if they could touch it. Let's just turn those on and off. It is gonna be subtle, but that's without our texture in the front. We'll even zoom in a little bit there so we can analyze that further. So we'll turn the texture on and off before, after. So very subtle. You're just seeing the, the tonal range in these grasses just increase. You know, the whites are just starting to pop nice and subtle. So on and off there, back on. And then in the distance, let's look at the rehazing that we applied to make those mountains look further off in the distance and then create the illusion that the foreground is more detailed. So the rehaze, before, after. All of these adjustments are incredibly subtle, but the whole point is they all add up step by step to create one big result. So let's have a look now. We're going to reset 
all of the local adjustments that we've done. So I push the masking button and I'm going to turn the, the visibility on and off. So that's where we were at the start and that's where we're at now, before and after. Hopefully you agree with me that we have a better result in the after. And it's not big, huge, dramatic adjustments, is it? It's just all these little ones that are adding up. See how the eye here is really more inclined to, in my, what I believe, just skim above the mountain up into the sky. After, now we've got that eye getting pulled into the mountains, not being drawn up into the sky. The foreground has just the right amount of details in there, but not too much. If we do a global before and after, that's what we started off with before any editing. And then that's where we're at now. If you can keep in mind those things, you're gonna notice dramatic changes in your photography and really get a more refined professional look in your images. All right, guys, I hope that made sense. Like I said, for me, this is stuff that I've just slowly learned and developed over a decade now, really. Post-processing is just so important when it comes to really finishing off your image. It's a big part of modern digital photography. As always though, if you have any questions at all, just drop it in the comments. I'll always get back to you. I hope to see you in the next video. Cheers.